Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady, and today's guest is Ginger Rothrock. Dr. Ginger Rothrock is the Senior Investment Director of Heritage Ventures, and they, that's the corporate venture arm of the Heritage Group, where she invests in early to growth stage companies developing advanced materials and systems for the circular economy, energy, water, specialty chemicals, and the transportation infrastructure industry. Ginger has worked at the intersection of science, business, and innovation her entire career and deeply appreciates the opportunity to merge her operating experience with her desire to invest in people. So Ginger, welcome to the show. We really appreciate you having you on. So tell us how you landed at Heritage. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate you, Sean. Uh, so Grew up in an industrial entrepreneur family, dads, uncles, everybody had their own small companies, scientific engineering. So learned a lot about hard work and resiliency and benefiting or struggling because of your own success. Got a PhD in chemistry, started a company when nanotech was a thing. Uh, it still is. No one talks about it anymore. Uh, ended up working at a billion dollar not-for-profit research institute, random material science group, things like building materials, carbon capture, energy. I really intended to do my next startup out of there. Um, over time, I had an, an internal seed fund to go through our assets and license some out and um, spin some off with great teams. But uh, one day, I, I remember vividly, I got a text from Kit Fry, who was a very well-known local entrepreneur and investor who had met at Duke twice and said, hey, I'm doing something really interesting now in Indiana. I think you'd make a great VC. You should come see me. This place called The Heritage Group. Um, so that it took me by surprise. Yeah. So, yeah. Like first rule in career planning is don't plan your career. You know right. something about that. Uh, right. Stay open minded. <laughs> yes. So I went, right? Six years ago, six years now, they were building one of the first hybrid CVCs. Investing off balance sheet behaves like a traditional VC. So it's an impactful model for the company. It's awesome. That's awesome. It sounds super exciting. And I've tracked you a little bit through LinkedIn over the years. And I did have the opportunity to come and visit uh, one of your startup kind of um, uh, lab uh, introductions to, you know, a lot of new startups are coming in. I can't remember the name of how you termed it, but a friend of mine was invited to be part of the group that was brought into the Heritage Group. And um, I came and visited and that's where I first got to meet you and just experienced yeah. the venture group. I was like, man, this is awesome. So yeah. I thought we should talk because this would be great. Cause I've been doing a few podcast episodes with other venture, uh, you know, groups and, um, and I thought, you know, this is really intriguing. And so, um, well, you know, what types of startups or sectors are you focused on there at the heritage ventures? HG Ventures. Yeah, you, you hit on a few, but for those not familiar with the Heritage Group, we're a 90-year-old private Midwest company, one of the biggest private companies in Indiana. Um, we've got, I think, over 40 operating companies in segments of civil construction, um, primarily road infrastructure, environmental services, so managing industrial waste and a chemicals business like fuels and specialty chemicals. Um, so over the decades, TSG is all about core family values, like long-term relationships, but also innovation and particularly right. partnering with startups. So HG Ventures was kind of a product of know what you don't know, right? Think about our legacy industries like environmental, right? Digitization, software eating the world, decarb, climate. Like how do we get more nimble as a business like this? So we were formed in mid-2018. So we have a formal thesis where we partner with entrepreneurs that are building the future of sustainable materials, infrastructure, and industrial processes. Hopefully I got that right. Uh, but but put simply, we invest where the Heritage Group can help. So we're the corporate venture arm. So we leverage people, asset relationships, and all our operating companies to support entrepreneurs scaling their business. So we invest in our core industries adjacent and even try to disrupt ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's fun too, right? It's like, oh, yeah. what just happened? <laughs> yes. Um, well, that's really cool because I think, you know, one of the strategies behind the ventures is like, you're, you're right at the forefront of startups that you potentially, you could utilize their capabilities, their skills, their service, their products in your operating businesses. For sure. And, and more importantly, hopefully they're ahead of where our operating businesses are. So eventually we can, we can help them move faster in ways that they don't know. Um, and they can help us catch up. Uh, well, that's good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, how large is the HG Ventures uh, fund and, and what types of, um, you know, I guess, what's the thesis for the fund itself? Yeah. So um, we've worked hard to set ourselves up in a hybrid model. So taking the best of like a corporate VC and a traditional VC and eliminate all the annoying stuff. So on the CVC side, it's like leveraging our assets, helping entrepreneurs succeed. Um, 
people that are driving the change in the entire industry. Uh, but we don't need business unit sign off. We can actually move as quick on financially as a, a traditional VC. So we do invest off the balance sheet. We do 50 million per year to our investments. And we're about the equivalent of a $400 million fund. Um, we started fund two in 2023. And so in, initial investment ranges from one to 10 million leader syndicate. I think we've done about 250 million into 34 portfolio companies. So we're really active. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Guys, yeah. <laughs> so we're in the US. Yeah. US and Europe so far. Uh, okay. But in addition to our fund, I think you might want to chat about our, we, we established and fund accelerator focused on hard tech. So I think that's where you came to our accelerator. Yeah, that's showcase the accelerator. That's what it was. And it sits yeah. right outside my door. I think we've had 45 different uh, pre-seed and seed stage companies go through that. And so usually say, if we just go into the accelerator fund type scenario, that is where you're kind of evaluating the potential startup entities that you might want to further go down the road with and, and do more in serious investment with. Yeah, it could. It's, it's one piece of our pipeline. I would say, I think we've done nine follow-on investments of our 35 that have come out of the accelerator. So it's a piece of it, but it's also mm -hmm. a great ecosystem play for us. And and yeah. also just for the people in the heritage group to interact with entrepreneurs on a daily basis, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, that, that sounds great. So a $400 million fund, that's pretty big, 50 million a year. That's, that's, that's a lot of, I guess, money to invest in. I mean, it gives you a nice little playground. Mm -hmm. Very lucky. <laughs> Very lucky. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. What are a few of the, the hot startups you guys have invested in so far? People might uh, not know. So you're asking me who I love the most. So I'll, I'll have to be politically correct. So we love everyone equally. Um, so let me tell you what the new companies we, we've invested in in 2023, and then maybe some I'm, I'm responsible for. So we did four investments last year. Uh, we did a company called Solar Cycle. It's a company focused on recycling and extracting value from end-of-life solar panels, as you'd imagine. Yeah, um, the cool. only one we're aware of, Bindex, which is a German-based industrial biotech company that um, it's like a synthetic biology play to control dust in construction. So that's an environmentally friendly way and uh, with high safety to bring that dust down. Um, a Clarity, which is all about PFAS removal and destruction, right? It's, okay. a, it's a chemical alternative to the incineration of PFAS, it's electrochemistry. Um, and then Eneritech was our most recent investment. So it's a German-based sustainable aviation fuel company. Oh. Um, and then we, yeah, we continued our support. And I think, I don't know, it's more between eight and 10 companies in 2023. So uh, after we talked, I think in December alone, we we added to Vartega, which is carbon fiber recycling, pre-tread using waste tires to create sustainable construction barriers and Electromet removing valuable metals like copper and silver and wastewater. So those might be of interest to your- uh, Yeah, your yeah. I mean, I mean, just talk about the, the pre-tread or the retread one. I mean, my goodness, with yeah. all the road construction going on around the country, they, they're going to yeah. be like- flush with work i gotta imagine it's, a, it's you know reusable sustainable product yeah thanks for the shout out i think they're going to open a, a funding round here in another month so oh that's that's sounds Happy to awesome chat. Yeah, yeah absolutely yeah we should maybe elevate that startup for more yeah. so well when you're evaluating a potential startup what types of attributes are you looking for in the leaders so I'd say there's probably three really critical things entrepreneur needs to have. Um, those are self-awareness, tenacity, and the gift of storytelling. So you're pretty good, at least at the last. Uh, we'll see about the first two. Uh, the self-aware CEO, CEO, right, like knows their strengths and weaknesses. Can they hire, surround themselves with people that know things that are different when they have gaps? Um, is their network broad, right? It's not just a scientist that knows scientists beyond like the scientific world. Um, tenacity is kind of obvious, right? How do you yep. find a way like, but yep. re relentlessly like pursue success ba balance with not being married to whatever your technology solution is, right? A lot of founders in our industry are relentless, but relentless that their solution is the best thing ever and not listen to customers. And then a, a great story, right? Big picture. It's critical for attracting talent, bringing on customers, attracting right. investors. It's, it's such a fundamental skill. Yeah. They need to be able to cast the vision, right. And yeah. communicate that to, to the, yep. the masses and, excite them right so yeah. what about their awareness of the industry with the market size of the industry with what, what the product is that they're trying to penetrate i mean that seems to be like has to be a, a key component of is this going to work or not it might be a great idea it might be a good little product but mm -hmm. is it scalable right 
No, you're you're completely right. We want to see scale and and really visibility to achieving those uh, hockey stick, right? Long term financial forecast, things like contracted revenue, off take agreements, partnering. Um, you know, if a company's pre revenue, we're looking at their pipeline. Do they have a customer that's referenceable that I can call? Right? Do they understand their value prop? Uh, really importantly, do they understand the time to market and the adoption cycles in these B2B businesses that you and I have worked in for a long time? It's, mm. you know, sometimes it's three or four years from when you first meet a, a new technology before it could be potentially commercial applicable. And does an entrepreneur really know that? And then, of yeah. course, unit economics, right? Like what scale makes sense? The, the recycling world, right, is one where it can be really challenging to understand really what are your unit economics? Are they going to work at the right scale? So how much does technology coming into the equation as well? I mean, because it seems like our world is changing so fast. And does that also come into play with some of your decisions? Like they've got a really good technology. Uh, yeah. You know, it's really going to work. You know, we had what I call like our middle school years. I think we call it in the very beginning where I, there are several instances where we invested in just technologies that we thought were phenomenal and teams that were like, okay, enough, right. not naming names. Um, and those just honestly have not done as well. Like right. we are constantly looking back at what we've done and what we've done well and what we haven't. And consistently when we choose technology over the other pieces, we've gone sideways. Gotcha. So, yeah. I, you know, it's great, it's not, but execution, it's not the execution, execution. <clears throat> right. Well, like you the said, leader. there's disruption all the time. And like, if a leader can pick it up and pivot and make hard choices, then. Then that's, that's then valuable. That's, that's huge. That's going to win. That's huge. Yeah. So that's big. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the challenges with investing in startups? I mean, you know, kind of talk through some of the issues that you face when you're like really wanting to partner with somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of it does come back to like the self-awareness piece, right? I think um, the focus on customers and what customers want, not what I know, what I've known in the past, being open to being coachable um, and, and really understanding the market. So many of the, the founders that we see have, you know, you open up a, a pitch deck and it's 75% technology and when we really want to see like 75% market and a uh, business plan. Right. Yeah. And so I think making sure that, that people are just, you can't talk to customers too early. I think that piece is, um, is challenging. Cause it's like, you can see it. It's going to be like, come on, man, like this could be really great, but I don't <laughs> understand yet. Like I haven't connected the dots. So I'd say that's probably one of our bigger challenges. So when you're working with a startup, yeah. You know, and maybe they're struggling a little bit to really cohesively pull together the business plan. Are you working alongside them, helping them understand like this is the best way to kind of promote pitch this and and you look at and look at all the you know the market factors? I mean, mm -hmm. are you helping them develop that too? Oh, for sure. Yeah, our, our structure actually allows us to sit on boards and be a fiduciary to the company, um, or have like an observer role where we hear about successes and struggles and and kind of proactively jump in. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's is like personal coaching and mentoring because people are just personally having a hard time. But a lot of times it's it's valued. We have a full time person that's a platform manager who actually works to connect our portfolio companies to the greater heritage group. So things like uh, deep market insight, things you can't find online. What are chemicals selling for right now? How are they being distributed? How do we move goods from India? What port? Like really specific questions that we can help uh, groups answer or talent, right? We've lent companies talent. One of our lab leaders became an interim chief science officer for a startup to help tackle a very specific scale up problem. <clears throat> and then pilots, right? We talked a little bit about talk to your customer, work with your customer. A lot of these entrepreneurs face a lot of these first pilot or sales cycle risks. You know, a lot of these companies are selling products to industrials and Mm -hmm. Now these corporates don't move at startup speed. They don't want to be the first. And we've been a pilot tester, a customer for a huge number of our portfolio. Yeah, that sounds really good though. I mean, you, if you can sit on the boards of these uh, startups and really provide that guidance that they truly need, because most of the time, probably some of these startups, they've been in the industry a bit, you know, they mm -hmm. have a fairly good grasp of what's going on, but they just need a little help taking that technical expertise to the next level. So that's really good that you guys are able to do that. I just sat with a founder the other day who was part of like, an, we were their first check-in, which isn't something we do a lot, but we did. And he's like, I, like, 
what are people even looking for? And so I spent 45 with, minutes with them explaining like, here's how a VC is structured. And this is why like they're looking for 10x returns and this and this is the asset class versus, you know, just investing in the stock market. So that's fine. Yeah, they're probably like, this is all foreign language to them because they're yeah, so deep and sure. steep into their technology and their product, right? They, yeah. they just don't have that business acumen, so to speak, possibly. So yeah. it could be, yeah, it's good to have you guys there to help them. How does the HG Ventures manage the investments in the startups? Uh, I think we talked a little bit about you you partner with them but and, and you sit on boards, but what else are you guys helping them do? Do you help them market the products once it gets Yeah, out? I mean for yeah. sure. It, it's it's a huge it's a huge round of, you know, realm of things. We're introducing them to customers. Um, you know, we have a sales our environmental group has a big sales team who does waste management for Fortune 100 companies. So making yeah. interest to customers, walking them into the right purchasing manner manager. We are actually out scouting startups that specifically fit our operating company's challenges. So I'm like, I know right now, for example, organic waste is becoming a huge headache for you know like food waste and other organics, and we're like. Who's out there doing a, you know, a distributed model for waste energy that we could yeah. pull in and, you know, immediately introduce to customers that have a need. So um, it works both ways. So we get great insight on the market from our own operating companies and then use those to go out and source startups that we could or could not invest in to, and bring them to the table to help everybody. I can't imagine if I was a startup and understanding the potential network value that HG has. Oh my gosh. You've been, I mean, that would be amazing. You like, you, you really do have your own network of potential uh, clients to, to bring these companies to that is like a huge differentiator from other investment firms. I like to think so. I, I don't know if I could ever, I mean, I'm a former entrepreneur myself, so I think it would be a hard to, you know, go to an entrepreneur and say, Hey, Oh, I can help you. Here's my check and uh, my own personal network. That would be, that'd be hard for me. I love the ability to leverage, you know, 6,000 people behind me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't have to know that. everything. Thank God. Right. We well, yeah, <laughs> none of us, we could never do that anyway, but yeah, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, yeah. so uh, I got to imagine there's some great stories from startups thinking, Oh my gosh, they just brought us into this client who now wants to buy, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of this type of product that we're doing. I mean, that's, that's impressive. Talk about the, if you could, you're investing in these companies. How long do you stay invested in some of these startups and when do you decide to exit? Yeah, I, it's interesting because Heritage is a private company and we have sort of a pseudo fund structure. Um, so there is a long-term growth mentality here, but the venture group is measured on financial return, right? We want to see and support venture scale growth like any other VC. So we believe we give resources to the entrepreneurs to generate better outcomes. They can be faster scale. And but we want to be aligned with other investors and the founders. You know, we measure IRR, we compare ourselves to other VCs. So um, I think it's both sides. We we are we don't have this arbitrary 10 year life to a fund. Thankfully, we have the support of this family owned 95 year old company, but we can let other investors or the founders drive those decisions. Uh, but we are at a point now where exit should be on the horizon. You know, companies are signing deals. We're six years in. Right. And we're um, excited about bringing some cash back to the the parent company for sure. Yeah. Right. Well, what's the uh, I mean, maybe you could tell share it with us, but what's the kind of the operating profit that you're really you know, what's your target that you're trying to achieve from the investments that you, as a group, is there a target, a strategy, a, a goal there for you guys? What's that look like? Yeah. I mean, venture capital is measured on IRR. So it's really hard to kind of give you, you know, what's the time value of various money, but generally a really good top quartile fund is an IRR of 25%. And so we're okay. aiming for above that. And we okay. are right now for fund <laughs> one, we're above that. So hopefully we stay there, but uh, I mean, awesome. we're trying to compare ourselves to the best venture funds and, and hang in there and show that we're both good investors and good partners. So I'm imagining in the realm of uh, the venture fund groups out there, do you guys have conferences that you guys go to and you get together and you tell stories? Tell me, is there anything that's going on with in that, in that realm or is it too competitive? Uh, no, it's both. I, I think almost every deal we've done, we've done with a co-investor. And we're not always the only money in, right? There's always investors that have invested before we have, often investors that will invest afterwards. So it's, um, what is that awkward word, co-opetition? 
Yeah. Uh, I would say there's a lot of cooperation within the, the corporate venture industry specifically. We actually last week hosted a global corporate venturing get together of the, the people that do fund operations here at our, at our place in Indianapolis. Um, and mm-hmm. there's a big conference in March every year in Monterey. That's the global corporate venturing. There's like 900 corporate VCs there. And so I just spent three days talking to potential co-investors and collaborators. And Oh, great. Good. Yeah. There's okay. a number of them. I mean, think about like network. Yeah. And and so I know everyone, for example, that's investing in PFAS, like we share data information because we're testing startups that are, you know, destroying PFAS. Are they or are they not? Other people I know in the microelectronics industry or the materials industry are looking at too. And so we're sharing deals. We're like, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Because there's so many start. There's there's going to be a number of solutions that are important for like the PFAS remediation challenge, and so that's one where a lot of us have gotten together and we have regular calls to discuss like what we're seeing and and who could be a good good group to pilot with. Yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah. and the, and the product that you you're working with now funding. I mean, you want other mm-hmm. co-founders to come in and help it for scale sure. too, right? So Absolutely. yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. Well, I, I kind of assumed that. I just wanted mm-hmm. to you know ask the question and and see how yeah, you guys are well. Doing. Connecting I will others. say we are, I, I gave a term sheet two nights ago to a company that I know has five other term sheets. I'm also like, dang it. I want to win that. I uh, want to win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It'll all be over by the time this publishes, but I'm like, uh, well, so you know, it's, hey. it's not all, you know, flowers and butterflies here. Yeah. I'm sure. Like you said, there's a little bit of competition there to try to win the startups, uh, interest. Yeah. So that's good though. Well, okay. ESG. Let's talk about that. To me, that seems like it's the big elephant in the room as far as a lot of the conversation of what we're doing with investing. How is that driving the startup market for you guys? Uh, um, maybe it's contentious, but I'd say <laughs> ESG is for us is not driving the market. I mean, <laughs> that, that phrase in and of itself is super challenging. There's no agreed upon metrics. It's culturally and political challenging. Unfortunately, it's hairy, right? So we're just like, let's just focus on what's doing right, aligned with our values. And we know E, right? Let's focus on E. Yeah. All of our investments. Yeah. All our investments yeah. are in companies with environmental benefits. It's core, right? We right. started our environmental business when the EPA started. Long-term valuable value creation. Let's invest in great teams with large markets. And we inherently believe that companies that would be categories as sustainable as you used are this decade's next serious money makers. Like, why not? Yeah. Right. Yep. But we don't we don't just fund a company because it's a big E. It has to be tied to one of the other big trends, right? Yes, yes, environmentally friendly and addressing a supply chain concern, right? Yes, E and addressing like a challenging labor market or uh, a metrics and regulation that are happening right now. Like all these economic factors and implication of climate change and the like are driving metrics and mandates and regulations. So, you know, it's a, it's yeah. a blessing. Yeah, I mean, climate change, the, the technology in that space of just helping reduce climate change. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, I'm sure, startups that are pretty mm-hmm. intriguing for you guys at you know, some way to, to mm-hmm. help you know, make a difference in, in that whole actual aspect of climate change. When you talk about the accelerator lab that you run, mm-hmm. how does it work? How does a company become a part of that? And what does it mean for that company if they're selected? Sure. So uh, our accelerator program is an on-site program. It runs for three months every fall. So we give access to our market knowledge, technical expertise. We do give 150K convertible note. Uh, Companies are applying now, like first half of the year, and then they come into the space to get access to basically all of the heritage group, right? Things like uh, we, we focus heavily on pilots, like we only identify and bring in companies that think that we can test their material, their product, their process in our own plants, on our own facilities, on the roads, whatever it may be, right? Um, because this first pilot and risk with long sales cycle thing that, that I mentioned before. So our goal is to provide these opportunities, provide critical first use cases to speed adoption. Um, we have corporate mentors from across all of our operating companies and outside to dig in to solve like big problems, right? But it's a two-way street. Startups learn from us and other big brands in our network and our corporate veterans can see the value of doing more faster. Yeah. It sounds like that's a pretty good commitment too. Three months. I mean, so somebody who's the leader of that company, whether it is the the owner or the startup, they've got to commit to come and practically live in Indianapolis Mm -hmm. for three months, right? They absolutely do. Yep. So we got to make it worth it for them also. There's lots of accelerators out there and I think every entrepreneur should look at the the trade-offs and make sure it's worth it. 
Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, that's yep. pretty cool. So, so any successes out of the accelerators you can share? Uh, well, that company you mentioned earlier, Pretread, uh -huh. the, uh, it's taking all the recycled tires and turning it into barriers. Um, yep. Well, they we funded and led their seed round, and now they have a operating facility in Denver, and it's a pretty cool operations. And they're making hundreds of barriers a day, going through tens of thousands of tires for uh, for some really cool products. So and, you that know, one's looking good. Used tires is a big problem across the country. It is a big That's problem. solving a big issue. It's a big issue. And, the, and it's actually one of the very few solutions that uses a lot of tires per product. It's like 70 tires per barrier. You know, those big con concrete barriers that are like when you drive on the highway, the things yeah. that are like lining the highway, it's that. It's replacing that. So it's replacing concrete, which is, you know, yeah. some say it's a bad actor, right, with a material that is sustainable and like 99% recycled. You know? Yeah. And we're, we're working on crash tests right now. Right now they're looking kind of promising in that they're also s significantly safer. So. Oh, TBD, man. but that, they're also working with NASCAR, which is really cool. Like if you're going to crash oh, into a barrier, that's a, that's a real crash. So that's we'll a real that crash. Goes. And if it protects them and now you've yeah. got the patent on, you know, that type right. of barrier protection, that's huge. Indianapolis 500s right here could probably I know. use it. I know. <laughs> they got to be a client. We got to scale. <laughs> oh yes. my god! We'll open our Indiana facility hopefully next year. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, well, so a lot of times I, I do these little lightning round questions with the guests and tell me a technology or sector that you're bullish on right now. Oh, man. Um, well, I mean, I have to say we haven't used the word AI yet. Yes, so. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Just kidding. It's like, uh, I mean, we should be looking at how Gen AI is going to impact our legacy industries, right? Um, it's an opportunity to invest ahead of the curve. I think we're we're really exciting about infrastructure development and urbanization. Um, we uh, published a future roads report that just covered this top this topic in depth, and we're going to have a um, an in person workshop with about two hundred people here on that topic in in two weeks. Here, basically, okay. summary is like roads have been the same for a hundred years. All the vehicles that drive on them are getting exponentially smarter. So there's so many opportunities in safety, efficiency, sustainability. Um, I'm also on the environmental side really excited about like the whole supply chain. You know, uh, the cost and complexity of doing business is just still increasing. There's so many challenges and decentralization of supply chains is is really interesting to me to meet those challenges. So onshoring, nearshoring, things related to the circular economy, I think are really exciting. Yeah, I mean, the whole circular economy thing seems to be, you know, establishing an infrastructure that mm. makes it easier to recycle just about anything would be really good. Yeah, I know that's like a silver bullet or, or, or some know. sort of high in the sky, but freaking collection infrastructure would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, a couple uh, years ago, I interviewed Tom Zaki, who's the uh, president mm -hmm. of uh, TerraCycle. And, you know, he's like, look, we're trying to create uh, the closed loop or the, the, this type of, you know, circular economy recycling network where you can just drop off anything into this bin and it's it knows that it's going to be processed in a certain way or, you know, this location, it's going to get managed in a proper way. Um, making it easier for uh, consumers would be huge to get more buy in. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, make it easy for businesses, too. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, exactly. Now, I was recently in um, San Francisco and uh, through the, I was flying through San Francisco and in the food court, you could literally recycle everything that they put you know, the food on. I mean, whether it's plastic uh, cups or, I mean, they were all biodegradable, recyclable materials. And it was like, okay. Is that an area that you're focusing on in, in the startups to help scale kind of that whole, make it easier to recycle instead of it's this yeah. single linear one-time use, you can recycle everything quicker. Yeah. I, I feel like in many ways, the technologies are already out there. You have to change human behavior. Yeah. I can tell you one thing I don't know anything about and that's human behavior. So <laughs> <laughs> it's I like I like <laughs> molecules. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I I agree. It's intensely important, and so trying to figure out ways that technology can be used to not even modify behavior, but work with what we got, I think is mm -hmm. incredibly important. Talk a little bit about a maybe a deal or so that you kind of passed on. You're like, oh man, that thing took off, and 
<laughs> we missed it. <laughs> I mean, is that happens any, is, all is there, the time in this business, yeah. right? Like yeah. all the time I'm wrong. If there's any like more humbling career, it's it's venture, right? Uh, you become acutely aware of how like dumb you are sometimes. Um, well, let's see. Well, uh, I think I told you, I, I, I'll tell you about the first deal I lost. Okay. How's that? Yes, yeah. we'll that do sounds that. good. Because that listen. makes me feel better. Uh, there's a company called Titan Biosciences. Now they're Cirque, so many of your listeners may know that. Uh, it's in textile recycling. The company was amazing. I'm, I'm so happy they're doing well. They're in Virginia. They found a way for um, all these textiles, especially like T-shirts that are cotton and polyester, finding a way to take the cotton out and reuse it as well as the, the components of the polyester. Um, I'm super bummed because they ended up picking a tin shed to lead their series a which is patagonia so i don't blame oh. them like who the heck is the heritage group right like and this is like let's go with the clothing company in, you know <laughs> versus like patagonia which is this amazing sexy you know sustainable brand so i don't blame them but it still breaks my heart because they're they're just a really great company i love them okay well i mean that's a great ex you know good example w what types of lessons did you learn on you know something like that where you passed and you're like oh, okay this is kind of where we may have missed the boat and and you know next time we won't do that type of thing is there anything there that you've learned yeah i mean it's hard because at the time it, we always have imperfect information and so ah, one of the yeah. things you can't do is beat yourself up every time that you get something wrong, uh, including when you make your own investments that don't work out. Right. Yeah. And so as long as you keep your eye on the power law, which is basically you only need one or two to do really, really well. And that returns all your money and gives you everything uh, you have to you have to stay focused on that. Um, one of my friends said about three years in, he's like, so have you reached the trough of disillusionment yet? <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, you're so right. You're like, wow, I thought that's the challenge of being in the venture. And I mean, there's so many benefits and I'm, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity, but you don't know if you're any good for like seven to 10 years. And so, well, yeah. And, you, and you're now, always trying to invest in somebody to make a big difference. And, and so you have your passion and your, you know, yeah. is all in the right spot. It's just sometimes it doesn't work out. Yeah. Right? Well, and there's a time estimate too, because there's a company, I remember, I can't remember the name offhand, it was a bio-based chemical company, but they went public in a SPAC. And like, had we invested in them, I was like, holy crow, we could have made 50X our money. But then, you know, over the next 12 months, the thing crashed. So oh. we would have actually ended up losing money. So it's like, and the, in the moment, we're like, dang it, how did we miss that one? Like, it grew like crazy and, you know, everything was amazing and fireworks and then, you know, by the time we could have actually exited it, it was like completely an embarrassment. So yeah, yeah. I mean, well, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's yeah. You, you, yeah. You, I think the key there though is diversification, right? Into different startups, right? So there you not, go. Right. That's my lesson learned. Diversification. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to help. Yes. <laughs> Whatever Lead the I witness. Do. Keep Whatever leading the witness. <laughs> Oh goodness, that's that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, well, so if you could, um, maybe with the listeners, talk about the some of the startups that you're working on that were really shining bright right now for you guys. Yeah, and, and maybe I'll talk. A lot of people wonder why you can get like good returns here. So I I would say, um, you know, we're working these like massive markets right? They're, they're highly attractive. Any hard tech markets are really big and vast. And everyone talks about size of market. If you're disrupting, you know, construction with a solution like, like a pre-tread or energy or fuels, like the sustainable aviation fuel company, we just made an investment with like so many of these sectors have not seen disruption for a while. It's just such a good wow. opportunity for innovation investment. And I'd say another unique aspect about this industry is like the competition is often just inertia. Like, you're competing against the status quo. And so, so many of these technologies may be particularly ones that are um, maybe doing like an automated waste within a facility to do uh -huh. circularity, right? Often you're replacing a person who was, you know, at the back of a facility, like testing, you know what this world looks like, right? Yeah. Testing the wastewater with like a pH thing and a bucket and like trying to you yeah. know, dump chemicals in, right? That's what you're competing against. And so I'm really excited about the opportunity to automate, you know, groups like uh, Electromed and Zwitterco or in the water industry, like w work working on automation of like waste coming out the back end and, and water being recirculated within a facility. I think, I think those are really exciting. And 
I mean, some of these have really interesting new business models, right? Like founders are founding so many more interesting capital efficient models for their customers. A structure like software, blank as a service, right? Uh, we make fun of it a little bit, well. uh, but it's like, <laughs> Yeah. May or may not have our wall of ass, you know, like hardware as a service, water service, data as a service, service right? Yeah. I mean, software. but we're seeing margins that are like 80% in these business, which formerly people only thought could be accomplished by software. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, these, these novel new business models are things that are, that are opening up hardware to, to really interesting venture like returns. Yeah, I worked with a, a startup uh, a while back um, with the former company I was with and they were working with a company that was in the water uh, monitoring sector mm -hmm. and, and uh, they were doing data as a service and they had proprietary satellite sensors that could measure the levels oh. of water everywhere. I mean, it was just awesome. you know, wherever they had them and then they would sell the data and create the, the data network. The largest, mm -hmm. you know, their, their goal is to create the largest water data network and it's yeah. you buy the data. Pretty in intriguing. And I think sure. it's got a lot of opportunity, but, you know, I think there's a lot of room for those types of ideas, right. Mm -hmm. Um, that are out there. So for sure. you should um, introduce me to them. I will. <laughs> Absolutely. I will be happy to do that. Uh, and I will do that. I think I know time. who you're talking about. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, lithium ion battery recycling has got to be a big issue with EVs these days. I mm -hmm. mean, is there, is there plays there for you guys? Yeah, well, uh, we do happen to own Serba Solution, which is the largest battery recycler in the U.S., so that helps. Um, <laughs> okay. But in our portfolio, we're looking at things around that, right? Uh, our company, Titan, has a very, very interesting technology for using ultrasound to test the quality of a battery. Um, so that, you know, either when you're making a battery at a, at a factory, you can see whether or not up front, whether or not this could be a hazard it could be you know, an immediate failure, things like that with, you know, super rapid tests for, for quality assurance. So I think those are really interesting. And then on the back end, they can test, you know, how much uh, potential life is left in that battery. So can you send it to Second Life? Do you need to recycle it and the like? I think not only battery recycling, um, but also those add-on technologies for figuring out this, the whole ecosystem of batteries is, is also really interesting. Are they actually also using the batteries to create <clears throat> alternative power, you, you know, for sure. for, like, oh, yeah. you know, a gens <clears throat> excuse me, basically yeah. like a genset, you yeah. know, instead of, there's uh, a lot, yep. yeah, there's a lot of batteries that are going into that, that, that are going into some sort of uh, storage systems. That's great. So that's awesome. Yeah. Hey, highest and best use of waste. That's all right. Day long. That's right. Let's keep, keep recycling, keep using yep. it, reusing it. Yep. So, well, if you're a startup, you know, and you're listening to this podcast, how do listeners get a hold of you, uh, Ginger, and and reach out to the Heritage Venture Group? Yeah, uh, well, I'm very active on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only Ginger Rothrock out there, uh, and my email is grothrock at hg ventures. So reach out. There you go, listeners. So this has been a great interview, uh, Ginger. Really, thank you for coming onto the show today. Um, lots of great information. This is an exciting area, you know, I mean, people, this is where, you know, new stuff is happening. This is where the next greatest idea is happening. And you guys are at the forefront. It's pretty cool. Oh, thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show.